this vision forward 20 years on the chairman of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, Professor Njabulo Ndebele. Thank you very much. Thank you. Molueni and Dumelang. Distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Nelson Mandela Foundation's Board of Trustees, I thank you for attending the 17th Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture, which is yet another highlight in our calendar and a significant opportunity for critical public deliberation on matters that deeply concern us all as citizens of South Africa. This time last year, after analyzing contexts within which the Nelson Mandela Foundation engages and works, the trustees took a decision to embrace constitutionalism as an overarching theme. In many ways, of course, South Africa's constitution defines the dream Mandiba had for our country and for human society more broadly. There are many debates about exactly what Madiba's legacy is, but we are of the firm belief that his legacy is best described as an unwavering belief in a responsibility to turn the constitution, the South African constitution, into a lived reality for all who live under its purview. The legacy belongs to all who, chi who choose to live it. And that means all of us South Africans. Madiba's belief in the South African constitution and his strong convictions regarding the transformative potential of the Constitution have a strong pedigree in South African history. The, a recently published seminal book by Tembega Ngubagaitombi, The Land is Ours, has a subtitle that underscores our Constitution's strong indigenous ancestry. And it resonates across my very brief remarks this afternoon. It reads, South Africa's first black lawyers and the birth of constitutionalism. And so once more, after being exposed to this remarkable book, I recognize how great gaps in the self-knowledge of South Africans have often held us hostage to our ignorance of our history, often leaving us arguing heatedly without a base of deep knowledge. In his introduction, Nugai Tobi summarizes what his entire well-researched book establishes convincingly at the end, and it is this. The idea of a Bill of Rights had its origins in South Africa. Not only did the ideas germinate from South African soil, they emanated from a group of black intellectuals and legal practitioners at the beginning of the 20th century. The idea of a Bill of Rights was a negation of colonial violence. That black lawyers conceived of it in an era of aggressive colonial expansion brings to the fore the shifting uses of law from its epicenter in Europe to the lands of the colonized. Law, he writes, was not always and exclusively an expression of colonial oppression. Sometimes it was an antidote to it, as is true today. But I think our formative legal legacy was more than an antidote to something. It was also more fundamentally a vision of freedom that was humanly inclusive and by the nature of law, underscore the responsibility to reason 
and to truth by all citizens of South Africa. It turns out that historically, South Africans were to drink from the same muddy waters of pain and suffering as African Americans across the Atlantic Ocean who experienced the full force of the brutalizing effects of slavery before we did here, and who were able to maintain a steady universal moral vision for the humanity of all far beyond the imagination of the European Americans who brutalized them, particularly in the American South. What's known as the 1619 Project of the New York Times Magazine observed the following. It commemorates the, ninth, the, ninth, the 400th anniversary of the beginnings of American slavery. This publication deploys rigorous research to trace the foundations of American and even global capitalism on the cotton and plant sugar plantations in the south of the United States. In the same way, it could be argued that South African capitalism draws its historically harsh character from gold mining. Profit at whatever human cost was such a character of our economy. At the beginning of the end of her article, at the beginning and at the end of her article of the 1619 project, Nicole Hannah Jones, Jones writes, our um, democracy's founding ideals were false when they were written. Black Americans have fought to make them true. And this is how he, she ends the article. We were told once, by virtue of our bondage, that we could never be American. But it was by virtue of our bondage that we became the most American of all. Nicole Hannah Jones gets to the essence of how, despite the most dispiriting circumstances, the strength and beauty of the moral vision that enabled African Americans to push the American Constitution to be as truly American as it had intended to be from the beginning, freedom and dignity for all people. Many of the American freedoms and civil rights enjoyed by Americans today owe their existence to the struggles of African Americans of over 400 years. And that is why today then, it is particularly important, particularly for those who designated or designate themselves as black South Africans, cannot afford to turn away from what they envisioned and saw so clearly in the most difficult times of their history, when their European rulers who had forcefully settled in this part of the world displayed over 150 years very little moral vision beyond their self-interest. All South Africans, particularly at this time, cannot afford to be, uh, to be, uh, can, uh, to afford to be not activist to our constitution that was designed to be, to hold us all to account in bringing about a just country prosperous for all its citizens. So how can our constitution be turned into an instrument for deep and sustainable change? What, in effect, is meant by the justice and equity in South Africa today? How can the Constitution become a live reality for all communities across the land? Such questions test both our imaginations and our resolve, particularly when we become mindful of the fact that constitutionalism can be and has been seen and utilized in recent times as a sophisticated instrument for protecting power, privilege, and property. And there are these questions which we have chosen as the inquiry for today's annual lecture. They are difficult questions we have posed as a challenge to our speaker. Who better to re wrestle with them in the name of our beloved Madiba than South Africa's Chief Justice, Mokweng Mokweng? Before I introduce them to you, let me say that we have many institutions and individuals to thank for making this, today's event possible. And this will be done 
by our chief executive in his closing remarks. But just two from me at the outset. Firstly, of course, to the Chief Justice for agreeing to take on this challenge. And secondly, to Vice Chancellor Marwala of the University of Johannesburg for agreeing to host us on behalf of the university. Your university, Professor Marwala, provides us with an ideal venue at this moment in our history. It is also on this occasion and in partnership with the university that we return to Soweto, which was the last location for the Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture in 2015. Informing our thinking was the fact that in just two months' time, on the 12th of February, we will be marking the 20th anniversary of Madiba's return to Soweto after nearly three decades of incarceration. What an invitation to deliberation. For soon after his return, he embarked on a singular challenge which would see him play historic roles in the country's transition to democracy, adoption of the constitution, and initiation of the transformation required to bring a post-apartheid society to fruition. How has South Africa repaid his sacrifices and those of the multitudes who participated in the struggles against apartheid? How well have we continued to work which, the work which he oversaw so, in the 1990s? For me, this will happen when South Africa's economic center of gravity, which some of you might find strange, shifts fundamentally from Sentin to Soweto. And that process, I believe, is already underway. I have no doubt that Chief Justice McQueen will focus our minds in addressing this historic constitutional challenge that inherently moves us all to action. The foundation will ensure that the energies generated by this lecture are harnessed for the continuing social justice work which we do and which our founder mandated us to do. This is work that all South Africans need and have to do every day of their lives. May today be yet another day of reflection and thankfulness for living in a country still striving, striving to make constitutional democracy truly meaningful. Without further ado, then, let me introduce Chief Justice. It is a very easy task for me to do already, but he has made an, an indelible impression on South Africa's body politic and is recognized with deep respect, both locally and internationally. And he has, the, he has led the country's judiciary through what has proved to be treacherous period in our history and is uniquely positioned to speak to our theme for this lecture this year. In his work, he has caused us all to believe in institutions which can deliver at the very highest levels. In his life, he has shown as how deeply held personal beliefs and respect for tradition can translate into an embrace of inclusivity. For all along, we all long to belong. For South Africans, the Constitution underwrites this longing. To make it a reality requires commitment to a long trajectory of hard work, a long walk to freedom. I have no doubt that Chief Justice Mohueng Mohueng will inspire us to recommit to that walk. And Chief Justice, we cannot wait to hear your lecture and we welcome you warmly to this esteemed platform. Ladies and gentlemen, Chief Justice McQueen.